So I did microbiology and later specialized in the food sector where we did food safety stuff. So we would go around to large factories and we will do audits and we would count microorganisms and we would look at food diseases and things like that. And big, write big reports and hope, hoped at the time that we will contribute to food quality. Well, it didn't really make a difference. We prepared a lot of papers and documents and reports, but we didn't really see an improving in quality. So later on, I moved to management positions and I started to, to learn about people. And I realized later on that organisms, if you don't like them, you can burn them. But people, you can't. <laughs> and uh, people are much more interesting than organisms, to be honest. So we started, when we go into factories, starting to pay attention on the people in the factory, the workers, rather than to pay attention to the systems and processes. And as we paid attention to the people, the processes started improving, which was interesting for us. So we realized that if we wanted to increase the quality of foodstuffs, the quality of performance, we need to change people's behavior. How strange is that though, eh? You get something that seems totally disengaged, but if you pay attention to the people, the outcome starts improving. So we realized that what we should do is we should start paying attention to what makes people tick. And I want to ask you this question. I want you to think a little bit rhetorically, don't worry, <laughs> rhetorically about what influences your behavior. Think about it a little bit. If you're a student, what makes you get up in the morning for class, sometimes earlier than other folk? What makes you study harder than some of your colleagues, or maybe less? What makes you, if you're a worker, get up and do your work? Maybe you are interested in what you're doing. Maybe that's the way that people do stuff around there. Maybe it's a physical thing, you know if you don't work, you're not going to eat. Or maybe it's because of this. And that's what most of us get in life since we at school, is fear of retribution. The teacher will stand there and say, if you don't learn, I'm going to do this and this. Or your, or your folks say, you must get up in the morning, otherwise you're not going to get anywhere in life. Or your boss or line manager says, you're not going to get your performance, um, your performance uh, a, a bonus at the end of the month or end of the year. And ironically, uh, consequence, fear of consequence, is a very poor human motivator. It's actually not a motivator at all, it's a mover. It doesn't motivate people, ironically. So, uh, your character, your personality, also determines behavior. But I want to make a point, if you look at this with uh, recognition to, to Bike SA, you will see something in this photo. There's two guys on a motorbike, going at high speed. The one is scared to death, the other one is just enjoys it. It's all cool, let's just go faster. So there's something interesting in this picture. Exactly the same environment, two totally different responses. So humans are also influenced by their personality types. So, we thought, okay, they are obviously in the food sector in our area where we work, microbiology, food safety, there's things that need to be addressed. In the papers, you've seen here and there food safety outbreaks. Have any of you, don't have to answer, had a pie three or four days old in the fridge? After three or four or five hours, something wasn't so nice on your tummy. Let's leave it there. Okay, you probably stay home the next day. We're all aware of the outbreaks. But there's bigger problems for us now as food microbiologists and that's the issue of food bioterrorism. Because in our conferences, it's generally accepted that the next terrorism breakout will probably in the food source. A little bit of Botox toxin or a little bit of anthrax in the food source. So we must look at these things and we decided, let's address it 
via the human factor rather than only looking at procedural indicators. So, question is, do bacteria listen to people? Just a metaphor of saying, can the output at the end be influenced by how we handle people? And it's not only in microbiology or food safety like this, any discipline. Whether you're an economist, whether you're an HR person, whether you are a broker, whether you are a legal person, doesn't matter. The variables stay the same. And we realized, yes, bacteria do listen to people. Take this as an example, and it can be any environment in any factory or in any business or in any occupational environment in the world. You have people spending hours diligent in their jobs, working hard to make a living the end of the month. So here they, there's a typical food handler, my reference area, food handler that works with chicken. What do you think she's or he is thinking about while standing there? Is, is the person thinking about food safety, microorganisms, audits, bioterrorism, things like that? No. She's probably thinking about how long she's been standing, when the taxi will be home and will he, the taxi be late again, what the family eat, will eat that afternoon. So addressing the constructs of behavior will have to speak to the things that are important to this individual, otherwise it won't happen. So that's something that we realized. So there are many, con many uh, influences, many constructs that's, that determine human behavior. Bongi said I should take the slide out because it's too busy. But if you go into literature, you will see a lot of behavioral constructs. Some people are motivated by knowledge, others are motivated inherently, intrinsically, others are motivated by the job itself, others like to be praised. I want to talk about one such a construct this evening, and that's the one of institutional culture or management culture. And all that culture is, in plain terms, it just says, this is the way that we do things around here. The story is told, it's not actually a story, it's a fact, of the guy that went to New York Central Station, opened his violin case and started playing violin. Opened the case so that people can throw in dollars. Played and after about half an hour, packed up, counted the dollars, he made about $10. Which I suppose, where's our business people, is not that bad. <laughs> made about $10, went home. What nobody knew is that this guy's name was Joshua Bell probably one of the best known violin players in the world. And the pieces he played were some of the most intricate in classical music. And he played on a violin worth millions of dollars from the 16th century. And a week ago, the same person was performing at the Boston Theater where the cheapest ticket was $100. So what's the moral of the story? People probably went because other people went. Okay. This guy's playing, his name is Joshua Bell, we must go and listen. While when he was playing over there, nobody, nobody cared. So we do things because other people do things. It's the same when there's a toy toy around, okay? We are going, it's this thing, we see our friends, we, we see the leadership, this is where we're going. There's a group, a group, group dynamic there. Can I ask you, your cell phone that you have or your car that you drive, have you ever sat down and really compared your Volvo's kilowatts with a BMW's kilowatts? Or, or really felt whether the seat is easier and nicer? Or whether your cell phone will take 0,3 seconds to do a calculation and that other guy's 0,32? Probably not. But they do that, so it must be good. So if we can, in an organizational setup, determine a culture that convinces people's behavior or drives people's behavior to do the right thing, it's a very, very strong way of getting what we want. And there's a, a, a graph that just shows that if you've got a leadership, you must work via a culture to the outcome and not directly, otherwise it's just commands. So, I um, thirdly want to touch on how do you then establish a good culture? And this is not only in, in business. 
So don't think this guy is just wasting my time. One day when I work, I'll think about this. In a team, sports team, in a class team, in your own work, wherever you do work or engage, this remains true. Leadership, we've heard presentations about leadership. Um, some says leadership, bad leadership is even good. I'm, just, I'm not going to go into this, only sufficing that good leadership, proper leadership, or leadership is probably the most important determinant of organizational culture, team culture, even country culture. Secondly, trust. Uh, there are many other variables, but I want to mention trust and integrity. Integrity just meaning you can trust me and I won't drop you. And that is why this is also in my title. And then thirdly, knowledge, but I want, want to say something about knowledge. Let's first quickly talk about trust. Try and remember this wherever you are. We've done this in the food sector. We've went to one very large company, the biggest multinational company in the country and we brought this principle through to them. Remember Sam and how Sam was standing there cutting the meat and what Sam is thinking about? What often ha happens is that the lowest part of this interaction with your employer, the service offering, is very simple. All that you do there is you work and you get paid. That's all. You do something, you get something in return. It's a very unsatisfactory, unprofessional and un low performing interaction with your employer. Needs based is the next step that you'll have to have with your people and with your employer and your workers. Meaning that my employer understands my needs, he realizes that I've been standing for five hours cutting this meat and he will give me a break afterwards because he thinks a little bit about my well-being. And the other way around, I will work hard for this person because at least they care about me. Third one there, relationship-based, actually telling your staff members, look, you've got a kid this afternoon that's going to play rugby, please don't come to work, go and watch the rugby first and then come back, because you're not going to have another chance to do that. Actually starting to realize that there's a relationship between you and your employer, you and your teammate, some of those, and then trust-based. And this is where you want to be in any organization if you want performance. And if you want to change behavior and get people to do what you want, you need to be trust-based, meaning my employer or my teammate or my colleague will look after me and I will look after them. So if you remember uh, Sam that was cutting the meat, let's say one of those pieces of meat falls on the ground and is full of dust, whatever. No one is looking. What will make Sam pick up that piece of meat, throw it in the bin rather than in the bowl cutter? The audit system? No. The microbiological standards? No. Whether they're going to miss or not miss the uh, performance management report? No. What will make her pick up the piece of meat is whether she likes the place that she's working for and she knows her employer will do the same for her. That is the way that we do things around here. So I wanted to say something about training and I'm, st um, I'm, 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 I'm stopping with this because there's been a lot said about education and I wanted to bring this one thing home and if you remember this, please, then we've, 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 we've had some success this evening. In our sector, in the food sector, and I think it's the same in your various disciplines, there's a lot of training going on. Every second day you hear, we've been sent for training with here, we've been sent for training there. Look at all my certificates, my entire wall is full of certificates. And then there's service providers making heaps of money out of the CETAs doing this. All right. But what you then get is you get knowledge here, but the knowledge, nothing is happening here. It's because it's been well published years ago that in terms of training, there's actually a value chain. Knowledge must change into skills, and the skills must go to values and attitudes, and then it only changes behavior. And 90% or lots of the training, even at universities that's happening, ends with knowledge. Knowledge do not change behavior. Skills and values changes behavior. So next time, please, when you just sit and there's just talk and talk, you're not getting value for your money. There must be demonstrations. There are all the value, the action verbs there. So I wanted to touch on these three aspects, and I hope you'll remember them. 
is that change uh, organizational culture, the way we do things around here, is a very strong determinant of, of behavior. Second thing I want to drive home is that in terms of knowledge, in terms of leaderships, and in terms of trust, those, those values will have to be there for you to determine a good uh, corporate culture. Finally, and I'm ending with this, is that you remember one thing, that doesn't matter whether you are in the economic business, in the microbiology, in the food business, doesn't matter. If you are good to your people, the outcome and result will happen by itself. Thank you.